Professor Clemens with you as we consider the atomic nucleus, nuclear energy, headed towards that. This is uh, chapter 31st, chapter 31 of OpenStax uh, College Physics. And in this uh, video, we'll introduce the chapter and talk about radioactivity and radiation detectors. In a subsequent video, we'll talk about the substructure of the nucleus and nuclear decay and conservation laws. So things that we'll discover in this chapter, in the whole chapter, talk about radioactivity. What is that? It's a, a term that's, that's used occasionally in our society. Uh, what's the basic structure of the nucleus? We've uh, finished the atom. Now it's time to delve a little deeper into a more energetic part of the atom, the nucleus. What changes take place when we have nuclear reactions occur? How is half-life used to calculate the age of an object, uh, radioactive half-life? And, you know, these protons and neutrons have already discussed before that they're in a very small space roughly diameter of 10 to the minus 15 meters, how is it possible that these positive charges, the protons, stay near each other? There's a huge uh, uh, electric force, a repelling force, huge in terms of the acceleration that it would produce on an individual proton. And ooh, kind of a twist here, uh, can we have negative kinetic energy? One half mv squared, mass is positive, we square velocity, that's positive. Can kinetic energy be negative? Food for thought. So let's uh, go on to our introduction here. Uh, dials on the old aircraft here, or watches used to be made this way as well. The dials will glow in the dark because of the radioactivity that they're painted with. Um, the the radium decays, the alpha particle makes a uh, uh, the paint phosphor and give off a light and it's actually hazardous <laughs> in terms of the radioactivity especially by the people who painted these dials and would dip their uh, paintbrush on their tongue to sharpen it um, but now we know better radioactivity of course has medical applications um, related to cancer and uh, probing the body this is not an x-ray <coughs> But a radioactive isotope has been given to the person, and the radioactive isotope is chemically active in a, in a way that uh, gets concentrated where the cancer is, uh, is uh, predominant. So, discovery of radioactivity. We're still in classical physics in the late 1800s. We've had the uh, photoelectric effect have a strange uh, explanation, uh, something that uh, was not uh, covered by classical physics. We've seen the atom, the electron structure, and also their um, explanation does not involve classical physics. And now radioactivity, a new experimental data that uh, could not be explained by classical physics. So in the 1890s, Becquerel was uh, doing experiments with phosphorescence in minerals, taking these minerals, putting them in light to energize them, and then put them in a dark area and see how long they would give off significant light. And to quantify this, he would photograph them and uh, see what uh, amount of exposure the film um, obtained by the phosphorescence in a dark room. Well, he had some of his film in a drawer and he put some minerals that had uranium in the mineral uh, on top of that film. and when he tried to use the film later, the film was already exposed, but he knew it had not been removed from its sealed package. It was protected from visible light. However, the radiation from this mineral passed through the paper, passed through the shielding around the film, and exposed the film. So investigations continued on this, and it was discovered there are three basic types of radiations. Uh, from uh, nuclei of unstable uh, isotopes. We'll get to find isotopes later. Uh, but the alpha particle is one type. It is now known to carry a charge of plus two units. So that's two times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So we'll just work with the plus two. And uh, investigations regarding its mass showed it was uh, about equal to the mass of a helium atom. The beta radiation that comes out of the nucleus has a charge of minus one. 
has a mass equal to the mass of the electron. Gamma radiation, no charge, and no mass. And some other things about radioactivity is uh, they put these radioactive materials at different temperatures. That did not change the amount of radiation given off. Different pressures. That did not change the amount of radiation. Whether the atom was neutral or ionized does not change the amount of radiation. A magnetic field, strong, weak, uh, non-existent, that does not change the radiation. And whether the uh, atom is tied up in a chemical compound in a molecule with other atoms, that does not change the radiation. So we're dealing with something here that is not a property of the electron structure of the atom. Uh, the electrons can be affected by these, uh, these uh, changes, and we don't see these properties, uh, characteristics affecting radioactivity. Uh, the electron is not, the electron structure is not where the energy is coming from. It's not where these particles are coming from. So here's a way we could uh, determine the charge. and put the uh, uh, radioactive source inside some shielding here. Leave one hole, so the radiations come up through that hole. And encounter a region of magnetic field. And we know that magnetic force exists on a moving charge particle, QVB. Magnetic force is charge times velocity times magnetic field. And it's found that the alphas curve one way, the betas curve the opposite way. Again, if you'd use right-hand rule, QVB, whether Q is positive or negative, affects uh, the way you end up with the direction of your thumb. So we have opposite sign charge on the alphas and betas. The gammas go straight through with no force being applied to the gamma. That's because there's no charge on the gamma. So a sort of equivalent uh, test can be done sending the radiations through electric field, and you get the same result, positive, negative, sorry, positive for the alpha, negative for the beta, and no uh, deflection for the gamma rays. So. What about stopping the radiations, putting up some shielding? It was found that it was very easy to block the alphas. One sheet of paper, um, about five centimeters of air will block an alpha particle. Uh, the betas can be blocked by a thin metal. And gammas, it's much harder to block the gammas. Uh, quite a bit of thickness of lead or some other uh, thick metal, dense metal is required to stop the gamma rays. So why is this the case? And how does energy play a role? So here we have two betas with the uh, difference in the two betas being one is more energetic than the other. And it's found that the beta with the higher energy is able to go further distance into some shielding material. Uh, so this is solid material in here. The betas are able to go further if they have the same energy, lead versus lithium, a lot less dense for the lithium, uh, more dense for the lead, and the betas are stopped in a, a shorter distance, and comparing the alpha, beta, gamma, similar to the previous slide, and except this is a little bit incorrect, it's showing the alpha is going too deep here. The alphas have stopped right at the surface. Uh, the betas go deeper, and the gammas, a significant fraction, go, can go through the material if it's not dense enough material. So alpha, betas, and gammas, positive, negative, and no charge. So these radioactivities, uh, energies are measured, and they are found to be in the order of a million electron volts, a million electron volts. The atom electron transitions are in the order of an electron volt. That's what we were working with for the hydrogen spectrum, around two electron volts. Um, these radiations are a million times more energetic. These radiations are coming from the nucleus. There's not enough energy in the electron shells to account for millions of electron volts. And our alpha, again, charged with plus two, massive helium. The alpha consists of two protons and two neutrons. It's a very stable arrangement. Two protons, two neutrons. It's the helium nucleus, basic isotope of helium. This is a massive particle, and it'll be slow moving. This kinetic energy, a million electron volts, one half mv squared. If m is large, velocity is going to be small. 
M is large for the alpha particles. The alphas do not move as fast as the betas. The beta, charge of minus one, mass of the electron, the beta is an electron. However, there is an antimatter electron, a positron, that some uh, beta emissions, beta decay can uh, produce. We'll talk about that later. Then the gamma, no charge, no mass, the gamma is a photon. So our alpha particle, a helium nucleus, nucleus, two protons, two neutrons. The beta, basic beta decay, is an electron coming out of the nucleus. This is not an electron from the normal electrons in the shells and subshells around the nucleus. This electron came out of the nucleus. The gamma is a photon. So all three of these could be called ionizing radiations. All three of them are ionizing radiations as the decay occurs and the nucleus changes from one uh, type of nucleus to another and very often with loss of mass and energy coming out as a result e equals mc squared. Um, these energies that come out in the millions of electron volts much more energy than is needed to ionize an, an atom only a few electron volts are needed to ionize an atom. So these alpha, betas, and gammas can disturb an atom, can strip off electrons. This is a way of detecting the radiations. We build some detector that uh, responds to ionized matter, and we can detect if there's alpha, beta, or gamma that's gone through. This ionization also is what makes them dangerous to you. Uh, we do not want our body chemistry changed. And atoms that are ionized have a different chemistry than atoms that are neutral. So this is the danger that uh, alpha, beta, and gamma will ionize uh, atoms in a molecule in your cell, and that cell will no longer behave the way it uh, should. So alpha, charge of plus two, mass even slow, helium nucleus, beta, minus one, it's electron, gamma, no charge. Why is the alpha the easiest to block? We saw that in the earlier diagrams. Why is the alpha the easiest to block? And think about these radiations. They're ionizing material as they pass through. The alpha has a charge of plus two. It's going to interact with more electric force than the beta or the gamma. We have a charge here of plus two versus one unit of charge for the beta. Uh, so there's going to be more electric force. The alpha particle, because it's massive, is slow. It spends significant time in the vicinity of the atom as it moves past. And that allows for more interaction of the alpha particle and the electrons around the nucleus. So the alpha gives up its energy to more uh, atoms in a short distance compared to the beta or the gamma. The alpha, there's more electric force. It's moving slower past the atoms as it goes through. It interacts more with the electrons of the atoms. So after it's passed by some distance of, uh, of atoms, num number of atoms, it gives up all its energy. It stops. The beta, the minus one, the electron, is traveling much faster and only has a charge of one unit. So it doesn't interact as much with the atoms and it can go further before it ionizes enough to give up its energy. And the gamma, we've talked about the Compton effect, collision of uh, photons and electrons, uh, but that's not a significant effect for slowing down the gammas. It occurs, but uh, there's not as much interaction with the gamma ray and the electrons around the nucleus in an atom as there is for the beta, and then the alpha is the most interaction. So alpha is easiest to block because it has the most, produces the most ionizations in a fixed distance. Um, it gives up its energy rapidly. The gamma is the hardest to block because the photon does not have a high probability of interacting with the electrons around the nucleus. The photon does not interact often with the electrons around the nucleus. So it has to encounter a lot, a lot, a lot of atoms before it will give up all its energy and be stopped, be blocked. Um, so ionizing radiations, the plenty of energy to strip off electrons from atoms, and that's basically how the radiation gets stopped. It's using up its supply of energy to strip off those electrons to ionize. 
We can detect the radiations. Uh, so here is a film, fil piece of film, and there's uh, various densities in front of that film. So a person wears this where they might be exposed to radiation. Uh, the film is examined later and if there is a lot of exposure then that person has been exposed to uh, perhaps a high level of radiation and they'd be uh, prevented from working in that area for a while. Um, they might have to be you know, monitored um, but uh, film is one way still of uh, monitoring uh, exposure to radiation and if the exposure is through the very dense absorber in front of the film then the uh, technician who examines this know that gamma rays were important. If the exposure is only where very thin shielding is in front of the film, then alpha uh, particles and medium level betas and gammas uh, could be producing the ionization and the developing of the film. Um, Geiger tubes can be used to detect uh, radiations. So we have some ionizing radiation coming into the Geiger tube. The Geiger tube contains atoms, of course, and some of those will get ionized. There's not quite enough uh, detail between this atom that gets ionized and the central wire, this anode, but we kick off an electron here, and there'll be seven or 800 volts potential difference for this anode, plus 700 with the cathode, the outer shell being zero volts. So what's an electron going to do if it now finds itself uh, outside of the clutches of the nucleus of an atom? We've kicked off an electron here. It's a free electron. And here's plus 700 volts. It's going to be accelerated towards this anode. As it accelerates towards the anode, it hits other atoms and knocks out another electron. So now we have two electrons. And they didn't have space for it in here, but these two will each knock out two. Now we've got um, four and uh, sorry each here one here will knock out one maybe two but uh, certainly one but the number of electrons grows rapidly and it approaches this wire and there's somewhat of a pulse of electrons that reach this wire and then electrons uh, sorry electronics attached to this central wire can detect a uh, pulse of current in this wire and we detect then the presence of ionizing radiation. The ion is created by the radiation, the alpha, beta, gamma, uh, accelerates the uh, electron to the, uh, the anode. It's not the ion that's accelerating, but the electron accelerates towards the anode. This electron ionizes other atoms, and we get this electron avalanche. So that's our basic method of, uh, simple method of using the Geiger counter to detect um, radiations. Um, so a picture of a Geiger counter here, portable bottle, or the meter here would tell the level of the radioactivity. And again, a, a thin window here. Why would you use a thin window? Well, if you want to have any hope of measuring alpha particles, this window needs to be very thin so the alphas can get through. And you even want it thin so the beta particles can easily get through. Um, and then the gammas will move on through. Uh, another fact about the Geiger counter, it does not detect all the radiations that pass through, especially the gammas. Uh, there's a certain probability of the radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, ionizing an atom. For an alpha, it's really high. For an electron, it's still pretty good through the size of this Geiger counter. Uh, but for a photon, um, not going to detect all of them. Maybe 10% will be detected that go through uh, the Geiger tube. And that's a guess of mine. But uh, perhaps that's the, uh, that's the number. And that's where we're going to stop in this video. Uh, that's where we're going to stop in uh, taking our initial tour of uh, the radiations. Radioactive materials emit alpha, beta, and gamma. By using magnetic field, we can determine that the alphas are positively charged, the betas are negatively charged, the gammas have no charge. Uh, further investigation showed us the alpha is two protons and two neutrons. It's a helium nucleus. The betas are electrons in the normal beta decay. And the gammas are photons. Uh, as far as the range, how far these radiations will go through some shielding material, um, the alphas will just go through the top layer of your skin. They can't get to your inner organs through your skin and they'll only go through a few centimeters of air. 
But if you breathe something in that has alpha emitters or you eat some food that has alpha emitters in it, uh, then your internal organs can be exposed. Uh, the betas can go through a few centimeters of paper, uh, a few meters through the air. The gammas, you know, 10 meters through the air easily, tens of meters. Um, it's a whole city block, 100 meters. And through lead, even several centimeters of lead, uh, gammas can still penetrate in some numbers through that. So that's where we're going to stop with the, uh, with the video. You should, uh, of course, read the textbook and uh, try to answer the questions in our reading guide.